Hello everyone, welcome to another session of the film where it's been a while. Today we have with us a filmmaker who has given us path-breaking films like Past, uh, the heartwarming Rajma Chawal, Teen Patti, and of course uh, a film that uh, I'm not sure if uh, everyone knows about Shab. Uh, that will t- that will be talking to her about that. Uh, we'll be talking to her about that film. But the film, uh, the series, that kind of uh, it was it was it was something else for everyone. House of Secrets, the Burari, Burari Deaths. Of course, I'm talking about Lena Yadav. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today, ma'am. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Let me just uh, share uh, an anecdote with you. So what happened with, with of course, uh, so how we're going to do this is that we're going to start with the last series that you did and we'll go in reverse to okay. your first film. Uh, yeah. So... the so when the show came out everyone was of course talking about it and two of my roommates they 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 watched it before me and they used to sleep in the same room so they watched it and after, right, right after the first episode they were they were like they like there was dead silence in the house i was like what happened kya hua tum log kya itna kya ho gaya aur the are yaar tu dekh ye kuch 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 bada ajeeb hai and i got scared i watched it uh, the next day and i saw ke, okay itna report hua tha itna to dekha tha humne and they were like nahi 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 itna no, tu pagal kya itna and they were really like almost on the brink of breaking down and when i watched the second episode i went to them and i was like can i sleep in your in, in your room i was so th- there was something else and so what i want to ask you is this that you coming from um, fiction uh, as, as as your medium why didn't you uh, why didn't you make this as a feature length film like of course when we hear an idea like this the first instinct is to make a film on this ek based on a true story type film banayenge so why didn't you go for that because nobody would believe it if i made it as a film and it is so true that reality is stranger than fiction and reality has to i mean fiction has to make sense reality doesn't true so i i immediately knew that there is no way because firstly i was entering this space to investigate it for my for myself because i felt when the case happened i didn't get any of the answers i really wanted it just went into this crazy uh, noise and there was nothing like the truth in between all that so i wanted to enter it investigatively and unknowing like i didn't want to know so that's how uh, i i thought documentary was the best format and i've always wanted to do a documentary um i've always wanted to be an investigator so <laughs> this gave me an opportunity to do both and i have absolutely no i don't think this can make it actually i don't i believe it cannot be so uh, when you, when you went into making this um what was uh, like i read somewhere that there were 400 hours of footage which is like which is not unheard of when you making a documentary and of course y- you must have spoken to n number of people when you went in what at what point did you start feeling that okay this this needs uh, w- was there ever a thought that uh, that kind of surprised you or shocked you that okay i need to go uh, dig deeper in that aspect oh my god there were so many things uh i mean what you're seeing in the documentaries is 30% of the things that we really went into and investigated and wow uh, so that's why i was i think it was over 400 for sure it was over 400 but uh, the thing is yeah i mean that's the other learning from documentaries is that ultimately from what you know i think only about 30% is what you're able to say because what we know as a team comes from two years of thinking about it of talking to people over 700 hours uh so that knowing you have to take the gist of that and see what is the important thing and put it in and but we had to investigate each and every thread of suspicion doubt or inquisitiveness that we any of us had so uh, what was that process like uh, i mean once you have that material so and of course because you had so much of uh, footage i mean and it was a series it could have been a longer series as well but you chose to keep it to that um, 
so what was the what on what basis did you choose what information to omit and what information to uh, firstly it was such a thin line walk that we shouldn't become what we are criticizing here right so and another thing that struck me hugely was the responsibility when you do a documentary because when you are uh, projecting reality as reality uh, it's you have to be so much more careful so a lot of uh, threads that we pursued if they didn't land anywhere which needed to be said um if it didn't land then we didn't speak about it because then again it's like leaving unknown things as it is there's so much in this case that none of us none of us none of us will ever know you know let's deal with what we know for sure at least that was the whole idea that defined all our choices that there is a lot to deal with even with what we know so i mean let's start with that and that's tough enough anyway yeah and the way it's structured as well now uh, the first and the second and the third episode the third episode uh, a lot of people felt that uh, you know you just took us out of the case and it was, it became you kind of universalized the whole thing and it was uh, suddenly we we all could we all could see ourselves somewhere and people that we know um that structuring now when you're doing that uh, was there ever a point where you felt that okay th- there there's a thin line where where you might become preachy or something like that was there ever a thought there always is that thought there always is that thought whenever you're trying to say something how you say it makes all the difference you know uh so you becoming preachy can happen in any format so that is a that's a something you have to balance all the time but um the structuring essentially a lot came out of the way we experienced this case so for us the first episode was always the spectacle the way we saw it then basically it was the spectacle and then what was missing from that time was there was no there were not people it was 11 it was a house it was 11 people dying 11 years 11 this second thing was who are these people you know so if you see it's the event the family and society that is the way it's structured and for me any story that i'm telling the day i start feeling it's me i never tell a story of them even if i made a film in a completely alien country i will still find it's me there before i am able to say it and i and i believe that we can it's not like you have to tell stories of only what you experienced in life that's not my belief i feel like the day the story feels like it it's me that's the day i feel like yes i know why i'm making this and very soon in the process of just the research i said this is not a story about this quaint little family this is about us it is about each and every one of us in society you know so that's why a lot of times you feel comfortable because you think it's them okay. you know and that happened with me in my films whenever they traveled abroad like parched like they would in america the q and a would always start with oh with all the rapes happening in india it's so timely you make a film like this and i would turn the mirror on them and say that firstly even if it's happening there as humanity you can't be comfortable about that and secondly can you please tell me about the rate of domestic violence in your country or the ch- uh, teenage pregnancies in your country in the moment they have to acknowledge that yes it's it's not them and there them and there cannot exist it's it's all of us we all have to take responsibility even if it's happening to them and there you know yeah and also with that um, i mean um, th- it's it makes it much more scarier the, the whole experience of it becomes more scary because we all know some 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 people like that we we and uh, and you did it very sensitively so that that, that was that was really uh, that was really great i mean uh, and this this one thing in the in the second episode i mean i'm sure you must be getting it uh, from everyone uh, that that voice over narration of those uh, letters uh, from the diary now you have the information okay so as 
as a as a filmmaker when you have when you get something like that that okay this is what happened now for them uh, for the family it might or my it may or may not have been a, a scary experience but why did you choose that the audience at this point should feel a certain kind of a eeriness i never meant it to be eerie to be very honest if you see uh, we've not dramatized anything in the show unlike other series we've not dramatized anything or recreated anything dramatically this was one thing we chose to recreate because if if i just told you it's these diaries and you just read it what this family went through for 11 years and this also the more and more we read those pages again and again it started hitting us at a deeper level that what this these instructions they had that impact on this family for 11 years day after day so i wanted the audience to experience it like like i was saying that even the structuring is what we experienced over two years we're trying to tell you in two and a half hours as a team trying to make this we we wanted the audience to be one of us and go through all those realizations as we went along the way you know very soon in the process the who done it for me totally became the why done it and how done it <laughs> you know i i realized that those are much more important questions and that's also when i realized that it's so interesting that actually investigating crime from that lens actually is understanding society because you're understanding where violence is coming from why that crime was committed and that it makes you understand society and uh, as a filmmaker the way you the way like uh, we keep cutting back and forth with the uh, with the with the police with the with the with the friends and and it's just the same set of people that we keep uh, coming back uh, uh, to again and again so the it almost forms like a narrative uh, um, function uh, so as a filmmaker were you ever concerned that is it engaging enough like am i like because there's already so much sensationalism around this case so were you ever uh, concerned if 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 this was going to be engaging enough for the audience I don't think I ever had a doubt whether it would be engaging or not because uh, I think every interview that we've done uh seeing this case from say a psychologist point of view or from the friend and family or from the cop it also tells you about you right it's also the way in which each of them processed what happened there and it is personal for each every each and everybody so it for me even like those four hour long interviews with one person was engaging in fact it was a struggle to like one thing you know there there are six people who have said it in six different ways like where do you keep that so there were a lot of decisions which affected the narrative in a different way also there's there's a brilliant cut uh, like when 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 he when the when the animal activist uh, talks about uh, that no uh, someone from the news talks about uh, that there was this, the the member uh, the only member that was left uh, was the pet and you cut to a, a a dog running away in the street almost as if he doesn't want to talk to the camera people what what was that like uh, that was so funny right out of the blue and i laughed so hard at that that i mean it's almost like the dog is running away i'm fed up of you guys with your cameras and stuff so the thing was all our bureaus we shot in uh, delhi chandni chowk burari the main thing was just catch life or catch all the oddities you see in the city it's almost like all the shots of people of animals of say the wires in the street it's almost like an autopsy of that city you know and that's why the ambulances going through uh, the city for me was um death traveling through the veins of the city so that's why we took a lot of the drone shots of the ambulances that how have we moved on from this like a reminder of death that happened here and taking it around that city you know as a reminder that how could we forget and it was shocking that in all that t- uh, media noise there was not a single analytical or you know um uh more investigative piece written on this 
Yeah. And now from that, like uh, the way sp- like what you spoke about the wires and uh, you tend to do that a lot. Like uh, you did it for, in your first film as well. I mean, um, I guess, uh, I mean, of course it was much more um, in, in, in a way it was much more accentuated and was much more on the front. But that imagery of the wires, and in the first film, it was the words and the letters with in the song sequences. So, uh, as a filmmaker, is it is it important for you to kind of find uh, some sort of a some some sort of an imagery and bring it uh, forward like that? Because some people tend to hide it uh, very subtly. So, what's your take there? I do. I feel like I'm very drawn to design, visual design, because. I think it's such a strong tool. I mean, when you work, get to work in film, it's an audio visual. And honestly, sound is as important to me as the visual. I mean, for me, the design of that, and not just, it's not just a layer. Let it say more than the story is saying. You know, why, use each of them as a tool to accentuate what you're trying to say. You know, even on sound, I'm very drawn to the design of sound and why we are doing what we're doing. Not For me, this scene should not just get dramatic with sound. The scene has to get more effective with sound and it has to affect the audience more. You know, and sometimes obviously things work, sometimes they don't. But for me, each layer has to do something for this. It doesn't have to just be, you know. Yeah. So what's your what's what's your what's your sound design process like? How much like? Uh, with, with, of course, with each film, it might be uh, it must be different. But uh, generally, how do you work around sound? How do you think of incorporating sound in your scenes? Uh, I don't think of. I come to each process when I come to that. Process. So it's not. Sometimes there is there is uh, before I go even to shoot. I have I have an idea of the scape that I like you know I would like to explore. Um, and then accordingly, you know, either the visual dictates the sound or the sound dictates the visual and, you know, to enrich each other. So I don't know, I have a different process each time, but, uh, like, I feel like even the smallest sounds or the right silences, oh my God, can lift your telling to another level. Definitely. Yeah. And, um, of course, in terms of, uh, sound design, or say visual design, uh, a very interesting, um, and this time like it wasn't as upfront as it was as it is in your other work. Uh, in Rajma Chawal, it was almost about like of course you've you've said multiple times that it was about the new versus the old, uh, and the eventual coming to terms with the the times. What where did that film come from? Like. In, to you, like, where did you find that me factor that uh, that you keep looking for in stories? So that's completely inspired from my father, who uh, was an army general, but had come to a time where he needed to learn Facebook and you know WhatsApp to stay in touch, and it was difficult, and it really frustrated the shit out of him, and he was just like. I'm an army general. I can't be listening to a teacher who's telling me I'm doing it wrong, you know. Uh, he struggled a lot with it. And I remember one very diff- And also, I was very, very disturbed by the world we were coming into where on one New Year party, I was in a restaurant. And I remember the moment clock struck 12, they were, people were not saying Happy New Year to each other. They were all on their phones trying to call somebody who was not there. You know, uh, I'm getting frustrated that the lines are jammed. So I realized that we are not interested in what's in front of, or so many times, I mean, you go to a restaurant and you see two people sitting and they're both busy on their phones. So this has had been bothering me. And then uh, I went to visit my dad once and he told me that he had been leaving messages for me on various posts on Facebook and I had not received any of them because he was not pressing enter after he wrote it, he used to just write it and leave it. (laughs) You know, so I just thought that this is such a funny, but very, very sad transition we're going through. So I wanted to put that and again, a father and son, I think make for interesting stories always. Their relationship is so full of so many things. (laughs) 
uh, you know, so that was some, also a place I wanted to explore. And I think the most exciting thing was uh, getting to shoot a challenge. Wow. Well, so, um, like, for that film, I mean, you didn't, uh, initi- like, Netflix wanted to see that film after you completed it. And uh, how did you mount that film? And how do you mount a film, such a film like that? Was it because uh, you had someone like uh, uh, Rishi Kapoor, sir, uh, in your film to get, like, um, to mount such a project? um no we already had an investor gulab singh tanwar who had already like you know who, who wanted to make this film uh, once he had heard the story so this was made completely uh, on the belief of a private investor wow so with that and uh, uh, like a film like that which was of course now we have an influx of films which are much more personal and like the, uh, of, of course on OTT and this was one of the very early films on OTT when it came out so uh, at, at that point were you ever concerned like before o- OTTs came in that is it ever going to find the right audience or, or not oh yes for me this was the transition right we didn't make Rajma Chawa for OTT so uh, when it was suggested to me when Netflix uh, suggested that I should I was just like no how can I just release my film on OTT, you know, like it has to have a theatrical. So uh, I came back to the office and I have some like five, six, 20 year olds working here. And they said, I asked them, I said, what would, they said, ma'am, this is the coolest thing. It's going to be a Netflix original. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, okay, one second, I need to just figure this out. Obviously things have changed here. And uh, then like two days before the release, I felt like this dip in, I was just like, it doesn't feel like this release is physical. It just like, I'm not feeling it. Like there are no posters, there's nothing, you know, it's just going to one day pop into your computers. And I was very disturbed by the fact that people are going to see this film on a computer. But uh, I have to say that within like, I think the end of day when it released, I got called and I think within 48 hours, all my friends and family across the world had seen the film, which has never happened before. So I said, okay, you know, uh, <laughs> it usually takes yeah, a world is, world is changing, one needs to keep up with it. Yeah. But uh, you've transitioned from television to uh, films and uh, now of course you start, uh, I, I, by the way, I, are you going to make more documentaries? Yes. So uh, with these formats, so like uh, now when you make a film for say Netflix, is there, uh, has that transition changed you um, in terms of your choices as a filmmaker, the way you place your camera maybe because you know that this might not be sc- seen on the biggest screen possible or uh, anything like that? So when OTD began, there was this thing that you need to grab your audience in the beginning because the way the platform C content is like, oh, we lost 30% audience at minute 10, then we lost 15% at minute five. Uh, All that is there, there is this pressure that, okay, uh, that you need to keep, you know, kind of uh, enticing the audience or whatever it is. But honestly, there is nothing. Make a good film and release it on any format and it will be good. These are these are things that we hold on to for no reason. But if you really go into it, there is nothing. You know, there is no one thing that is the truth about the difference between this and that. Uh, similarly, like at the end of it, even in documentary, you're telling a story, right? It's just that you have different tools. So it's, I want to keep changing my, you know, I have never repeated genres or, or this thing. And that's the thing because the more curious you are, the more you'll be able to, uh, I think, uh, address. So at this point of time, moving forward, what what exactly are you curious about? Like, I mean, what is it that interests you? <laughs> I'm curious that why hasn't the world changed? <laughs> I, I told my husband that, you know, lockdown has changed us all and content will change and all. And he's like, this is bullshit. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Has it got something to do with tentpole films being back at the box office or stuff? It has to do with a lot of things. <laughs> but uh, but 
honestly my world has expanded because i have got braver and i have started realizing that every story can be told you have to just find the right way and the right medium to say it um and this country is rich so rich with stories that there's no dearth of stories there is a big dearth of writers but uh, it will find a way yeah that's so 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 uh, you said that uh, shooting at chandni chowk was very uh, exciting for you um and chandni chowk is something that uh, a lot of like delhi films uh, so to say have explored before um what what was it uh, that that kind of drew you to Ch- chandni chowk that okay the, the visuals or what what was it that interested you i think the spirit of the place it is it is the most unusual place for sure uh and it's almost like you're in delhi you turn one lane and tada you know you're in a different world you know and that world epitomizes everything old and new in one frame everywhere you know and then there is the spirit of that place oh my god that i think i remember this when i started my rekis there was a whole discussion about tolerance and it how we tolerate people and when i stepped into chandni chowk i said oh yes we are the most beautifully tolerant you know including all those little outbursts that do happen all part of the game but oh my god so beautiful like there is no part of any house which is belongs only to that house you know somebody's chhat is somebody's uh, floor and somebody's balcony has uh, somebody else's bathroom under it you know that whole place it's just it's so beautiful and then the food of chandni chowk like oh good food while film making can be like the biggest drug <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah i mean uh, with so with that film like um, when you look back at it or oh, okay let me let me put this way when you look back at your films um are you one of those people who like cringe uh, watching their own films no it, it's not like i feel they're perfect from any standard but i look at myself growing up i was just like hmm okay interesting <laughs> why did i do that but i'm accepting of it and there is no way i want to remake anything that i've done or better it it's done it was meant in that time and space i'm done with it in fact the day i finish making my film actually i have i cut a cord and then because there is that point the day your film releases it doesn't remain yours it becomes the audiences and actually the most potently how i felt this was on house of secrets everybody had it nobody was asking me questions and i that's why i do not want to speak too much about that because it it now does belong to everybody cool. and everybody is a filmmaker or interpreter of that piece in whichever way you want there is no one truth and we have not even tried to project one truth you said that you've been uh, you've become braver you and uh, one of the most brave films uh, that that we've seen uh from me was past now making a film like that first of all that film uh, sometimes a film like that of course gets clouded with the uh, issue based tag uh, that kind of takes away uh, all its uh, cinematic cinematic integrity i guess and how how did you go about writing that film first of all i mean of course you we've read that okay you were, you were interested in that space but to form uh, characters like that and what was what was the writing that film like okay so past came from a point of rock bottom <laughs> because after teen patti i actually didn't want to direct it i just said that i cannot do this um that's when my husband was a cinematographer he told me you make another film and i will produce it and you will decide everything on that film every poster every promotion everything 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 and there is no pressure of any actor or anything anything on you you choose your team and you shoot it the way you want very very difficult promise to make because <laughs> it was a very very tough journey making that film was very tough but also when something needs to be made it just gets a force which is unexplainable so everybody who got 
associated with that film. I mean, what a team we became. Everybody just knew we had to do this. There were days when we, we didn't know whether we'll be able to shoot tomorrow or whether the uh, you know hotel will chuck us out. We went through like crazy times doing that. But you were asking me about the writing of it. So basically, it started with a conversation with Anishtha Chatterjee, the actress. And uh, we said, let's do something together. We started talking. And she shared an experience of while she was shooting another film. She said, you know, the conversations about sex amongst women in the village are so much more honest. So we traveled around Bhuj. And this originally was set in Bhuj, in Gujarat. And we traveled there and uh, had lots of conversations and it blew my brains. And again, coming back to Bombay, I was writing this. I said, oh my God, I'm not writing about them. It's about all of us. <laughs> you know, but it's so interesting that we are setting it in a place where there is no TV, there's no uh, information, there's no education. Uh, that's so amazing. So then what, what does this mean, this progress that we think we've had? You know, where, what is... The value of this then. Um, so I don't know. Past was, I think, my fast. Shabd and Past were the fastest written films. I think I wrote both of them in two weeks each. Wow. And then I just wrote it and I sent it out. And something told me that this is not a conversation just in India. So I sent it to a lot of my filmmaker friends across the world. And for the first time, I didn't get script notes. I literally got emotional emails saying, Oh, I know a woman just like Bijli right here in New York. I know somebody like this in Istanbul. This is a story. I said, oh, oh, okay, one second. So this like really has so much. And I think till then from there on, I got rejected from 30, 40 villages because they wouldn't, when they saw me, they said, oh, more women like you are going to come to shoot. I said, yeah. They said, no, no, we won't give you permission to shoot. Yeah, women will get corrupt looking at you. So that came into the script. Every experience we had trying to make that film kept make, making its way into this film. So I think it came from so much heart all the way. I mean, every actor, every technician brought their own story into that film. Wow. And what, like, as you mentioned that uh, the way you were going along, uh, you made it a part of the narrative. What were some of the things that you guys, uh, was, was the character of Kishan and his wife so, like people who are the outs look done look down as the outsiders in the village was that uh, the uh, so there? Kishan actually came from a part of uh, kind of uh, what do we call it like uh, mythology or whatever of Gujarat so when I was traveling in Kutch in lots of the restaurants I would see this guy in a, with a dhol and women dancing around him. Yeah. It felt like it's a kind of a legend. So I asked uh, I asked someone and they said that uh, so this was uh, he was a legend that this guy was a traveling musician, came into a village and he started playing the dhul every day at sunset and the women would dance and the moment they danced it arose their sexuality and when the men would come home, suddenly these pieces of flesh that used to lie under them started becoming demanding, you know? And so all the men got together and killed that dholi and all the women committed sati. I said, oh my God, I, I didn't know that this was a legend, you know, over here. So, so Kishan is my interpretation of the dholi. So he, instead of music, what he's doing is he's giving these women economic freedom. He's paying them money. So that's the new dance. And of course, this legend got made into a film called Hilaro um, in, in Gujarat. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a brilliant film. Um, and uh, what was like, like as you mentioned, the, the shoot was uh, particularly difficult where at points you felt that maybe tomorrow you guys won't be able to shoot. What, wh why, why did that happen? What was that uh, whole situation like? Because we just went and started shooting to start with. We didn't have any investment. Uh, Ajay Devgan helped us initially. Then, um, again, the same producer of uh, Rajma Chawal, Gulab Singh Tanar, and that's how we have the association with him. He stepped in. Uh, 
and he said oh my god this film has to be made then rohan jagdale so angels kept coming and helping us along the way and uh, that's how that film got made i mean i worked with some of the biggest technicians of the world with <laughs> with such a small budget i mean it's such a privilege that's why when a story needs to be told everything happens and it happens <laughs> How did you guys go about like planning the shoot with on such a shoestring budget? I mean, if you can tell us what the budget was like. I mean, uh, because here I'm sure, including me, there's a lot of people who are trying to make their own films, and of course, uh, we don't have any money to make. Ultimately, it. the budget went to around I think six crores or something. I think over that, over that, a little over that. Um. So no, it started a lot of the pre and the development happened. I mean. at our own costs you know i was writing the script till the script was written then we got actors on uh, who were genuinely like interested and i think all the actors broke personal boundaries to play those roles with the nudity and everything which is like hats off to them um i don't know I don't think we were thinking any so. I mean, we just wanted to make the film, and we made it. <laughs> like we didn't stop the way. Um, we got Russell Carpenter, one of the biggest DOPs in the world, to yeah. make the film, who also read the script and came on board. And he's, uh, we told him we can't afford you. He said, "I will afford you because I need to do this." Um, so it's actually I've always been like this that. Um, you shouldn't censor yourself you shouldn't say that oh i don't have the money i have the biggest thing i have the greatest idea so i am actually most powerful money is not power i have that idea and i will go to i will not say oh i won't go to so and so actor because i will never be able to pay his fees i will go to him and say i can't afford you but here's the idea you want to do it Yeah. So reach for the stars, and then it's their thing to say no, and that's what I found really amazing uh, with at least people that I interacted in Hollywood versus here, is there some people will outright tell you there's so much clarity. Oh, I don't do passion projects. Great. Second opinion. Oh, it's a passion project. You don't have money. Hmm. Then I need to love love it to do it. So show me. and then once you do it by choice they're not going to tell you for the rest of your life that they did you a favor <laughs> because there is a clear transaction of why they are doing it they want to be part of it it's a choice they are making and of course uh, like the, all the actors who uh, ultimately became a part of your film did a brilliant job and uh, it, it it showed that it was made out of love um, and it was a really great film and uh, now you said that you almost didn't want to direct after teen patti what did the failure of teen patti do to you uh, creatively uh firstly with both my films shabd and teen patti i don't think i got reviews i got very personal attacks from people and whatever how much ever you say oh i don't believe this it's it's very which shabd and teen patti and you are was making very different films okay they were not the typical bollywood films so obviously people will like it and not like it and that's acceptable but when people attack you like that it's a bit i mean not a bit which shabd i almost was in depression for 6 months and i was just like what am i doing why am i doing it? you know um i love films i wouldn't have like left films i would have probably just been a writer or something but i just felt like with the amount that you put in and people don't even get it then maybe like i'm in the wrong profession you know maybe i am with the wrong audience or whatever it is but patch broke that for me at another level what did you feel uh, what did you what do you think made patch uh, connect that didn't uh, like there was something that was missing from uh, teen patti i think patch got an opportunity to to find its audience these films were suffering from different storylines which had big stars so had an ex expectation yeah yeah you no know? so uh, and then within and that was theatrical time i mean within your first day and then you get reviews which are like this and then within two days 
people didn't understand oh my god what is this i went to see a love story but this was a fucked up journey of a man i went to see a heist film and this is a fucked up journey about greed you know uh, also the audiences were not you know when things like this happen i think so many times the filmmakers are questioned but it's a two way street i mean a lot of times people say why don't you make films like this more films like this because now the audience has to take that responsibility they don't come and they still look at the face on the poster and go and to watch a film okay you know so yeah it's complicated but uh, teen patti you had uh, ar madhavan you had mr bachchan you had ben kingsley i mean uh, you had all these and these are people who actually believed in your idea um so what while making it a, like were you ever thinking that okay was there any point where you felt that okay this might go on to become something that you know that only uh, we will get like you know it was is a film about mathematics probability and all and everything it was it wasn't a film that people would have expected as you mentioned so while making it were you ever conscious of that fact or no yeah i thought i was making a very very commercial <laughs> i i thought that there is so much entertainment there is so much drama variety everything so even if one one gets it only at that level it's got something and for people who want to see more there is that too but not everything not every calculation goes right so it is what it is <laughs> i mean uh, but um, of course like just the just the sheer idea of a film like that existing here and with stars i mean today it will be very difficult to pull that film off what was what was what was that uh, what what was the germ of the idea that got you excited towards making a film about I mean, I I really whenever there's the whenever someone mentions that film, the only thing I remember is probability because I used to study probability at the time, and that film was countlessly referenced again and again. So, what what drew you to that idea? Actually, it was a um, Vishal Shekhar, the music director. Vishal uh, actually told me he saw something on uh, one of the channels that time. I'm not sure which one. but basically about this group of students in mit who had cracked probability and were uh, it's called card counting and through the years made like crazy amounts of money and how it fucked all of them up because they used to every weekend travel to vegas and come back with bags and bags full of money you know or sometimes they how they passed through security they were padded with wads of notes and you know i said this is really interesting but um and then i went and met a professor at uh, iit amazing uh, uh, professor called subramanian and i named uh, mr bachchan's character also subramanian after that and i said if you if you crack something like this uh would you go cheat and he says yeah for a crore i could kill some you know and then i said what are there are different phases of greed i mean one is obvious money power but there is also greed of recognition and how that fucks you up too so uh when you don't get what and for me that was the journey of the professor which mr bachchan said um so i i thought it's a very interesting thing to uh you know kind of uh, explore and i thought it was extremely topical for the time that we were in whether it was education or it was uh, power and money there was a lot of you know get to that fast get to that fast you know short track yeah so yeah <laughs> that's why it was very very pertinent and very very important for me to tell that story at that point in time <laughs> so like because um... your way of making the film your way of your way of uh, like the form that you explored in a film like past was very different from a film like teen patti teen patti was more slicker and a kind of a film that you would expect uh, because from the promos at least you would expect a star studded film to look like at least uh, so do you feel that somewhere because you, you felt that there was a certain responsibility that you had to cater to an audience to a larger audience the idea that you know you had so 
to simplify stuff or to make it a little more over the top was that a thought conscious thought in teenpati for me the whole thing of gambling itself in character was a loud thing so i mean we did a lot of work as you and i did a lot of work on deepati also where we uh, played a lot with color we color coded the film yeah. you know, the the succession of greed and at the same time every time that team meets in the lab it gets more and more these sad till blood is almost gone out of the faces so i mean these are subliminal level things they're not things that an audience will notice but it was very very designed we were not catering to anything I and mean, we were not catering to a mass audience or anything uh it was designed for the world that we were exploring now uh, from shabd to team but it took you a while um what was I, it be- yeah <laughs> and five years from team patti to past i was on a panch saal yojana that time <laughs> सरकार बदलती रही आप आते रहे तो वो जो पीरियड था लाइक बिटवीन शब्द एंड तीन पत्ती एंड ऑफ कोर्स द फेलियर ऑफ शब्द आल्सो काइंड ऑफ ब्रॉट यू पुल यू पुल यू डाउन अ लॉट एट दैट पॉइंट व्हेन योर फर्स्ट फिल्म डजंट वर्क व्हाट डज इट डू टू अ फिल्म मेकर कैन नेवर एक्सप्लेन इट अ Okay, it's like you're standing naked on the road, yeah. and you asked for it now, and everybody has an opinion, and anybody can say anything to you. Nothing in the world prepares you for it. Um, for me, it was more hurtful because it was very personal. Um, I was ready to listen to a actual discussion about, okay, this did not work or. for so and so reason or because i did feel at that point i was exploring something really different with mainstream stars and for me that was a huge challenge i mean if not give points for the film because you didn't like it understood give points for the effort or for the fact that these actors also signed on for something like this yeah. otherwise what are you telling them that never do this just do what you're doing Yeah. so there is this subliminal mediocrity that we all want to kind of uh, celebrate all the time at least fail experimentally yeah and how did you get uh, like of course we've seen this with you, in your films time and again how do you get people excited with your ideas i mean because these are ideas that uh, that that a finance or a, or a typical producer might outrightly say that your picture they're gone but um, how did you how do you get these people excited as as a director how do you make them buy your idea um which shop i was really lucky i uh, met pratish nandi and rogita nandi and actually it was a meeting that my husband pick, uh, fixed up because he was shooting chameli for them so i think they met me out of politeness ki someone's wife you know wants to meet them or something and uh, and they were very surprised with what i brought them and they were completely like wow we want to do this and actually when a scene fixed up that meeting i just said i'm not ready i need two three more years he says lena it's not like the first guy you meet is going to make your film it might take you five years to even make make a film but my first <laughs> meeting and they said okay you know end of the meeting pradesh nandi picked up the phone and started calling up actors listen i want you to hear this and i was just like is this real and then the thing is the thing is we apply so much censorship nobody will agree to this idea nobody will do this i was surprised i mean even i didn't think this was an easy sell but head on i got this i went and met actors they did say oh my god it's i've never heard anything like this they were also scared of the morality of each character because for a change in the script everybody is great you know um, but hats off they signed on to it yeah they signed on to it and you pulled it off and the world uh, told them don't ever make this mistake <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, so and somewhere i read that uh, at that time um, films with such big stars usually took a, uh, around a couple of years to get made and you finished it off in 30, 37 days 
Yes. What After is that? that I got a lot like? of offers. <laughs> People came to me and said, uh, "Can you make a film with Sanjay Dutt and Sunil Shetty in thirty days?" The date will be. So, 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 I said I need to punish myself for all the mistakes I made. I will wait for five years before I can do another film. <laughs> what, what? So, like, uh, what was when you look look back at the film after a while? Of course, uh, what were the mistakes? Where did you feel that you know this is where I went wrong? In Shab. Yeah. Honestly, I thought I was bloody brave. I wouldn't do many of those things today. i was very innocent and brave so there is a magic about first films you know because uh, you never done it before and you think everybody is going to clap for you so you are the bravest you'll ever be after that it's your own interpretation of reactions responses oh i should not do this i should do this i keep trying to shut that voice in my head but it is there it it's real <laughs> uh, but Yeah, I think I was very, very brave. I am. I have no regrets at all in that film, and I got to do some crazy things. I had, I had a great experience with my actors. Before I went to shoot that, people had literally told me, "You're never going to make be able to make this film because Sanjay that doesn't uh, stay on set for more than two hours, and I swear you, it takes five hours to do her makeup." So, like, doom had been declared before. <laughs> i had started but none of it was true so that's the thing again for all new filmmakers somebody else's truth is their truth you make your own don't hear from five people that this one is so horrible i got that even before rajma chawal that rishi kapoor is difficult to work he was one of the greatest experiences of my life what a beautiful beautiful man what a lovely foodie <laughs> you know and Uh, what a collaborator yeah so uh, before shabd of course you were doing pretty good, pretty great in in television like i mean the shows that we've grown up watching and some somehow you were attached to those shows um what was that time where you felt okay like there's something that i ask everyone what was that time where you feel where you felt that now i have to make my own film i think uh I saw an amazing transition in TV. Uh, suddenly, I mean, not suddenly. There was a transition. Uh, so scripts were being written, and on script it was written: three zoom ins, three crash zooms, three switch zooms. <laughs> you know, and I was just like, "This is not what I want to do in life." You know, then I'm I'm catering now. I've suddenly become a, in the catering business. <laughs> but for quite a large part of that time i actually took it up as a challenge and i said okay they need this to be extra dramatic okay they need to underline this so i would do like uh you know either jump cuts or cut from extreme wides to extreme close ups and i would try and tell the channels that it has the same effect i mean i don't need to do what you're telling it to yeah you need drama i'm experimenting i'll give you some other kind of drama so it was actually tv was a great learning ground for me i got to experiment with so many things i even shot uh scenes intense conversation scenes between two actors who have never never, never been in the same space at the same time uh but i i didn't give up my aesthetics i used body doubles and that kind of thing so it was a great learning ground wow and people have this uh... sort of like like an apprehension where, where they feel like um, television kind of aesthetically uh, takes away a lot of cinematic uh, understanding of a filmmaker like visually because it's mostly people say that ki ha cover is a the taking tighter shots and everything and but uh, what was did you ever felt that it somehow like any of the was that true? you know that also a lot has to do with technology when when i did start off we didn't have great tvs okay uh so this is like conditioning that we human beings have gone through once we've been told something that becomes the truth 
So what happened was they said, okay, shoot bright because each TV set had different. So sab dikhna chahiye was the rule. Yeah. So then suddenly newer TVs came in, but sab dikhna chahiye didn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, I once actually been told by a executive at a television company that your visuals now they're trying to they are very they are very film like i said isn't that a good thing <laughs> no it has too much depth i said what ya film mein nahi depth aa rahi logo se so um, okay i mean uh, with that we come to the end of uh, uh, my conversation with you ma'am thank you so much uh, now i'm going to take up a few questions that our audience has uh, have sent okay so someone has asked that uh, how is your experience as a f- female director navigating a male dominated industry i don't pay attention to that i mean it if it bothers people it's their problem it's never been my problem yeah, i did someone- start off in a more uh, difficult world but with god's grace at the end of it you have to know how you need, need to do your job and stop paying attention to this because if people around you want to and you also start engaging with this then that's what your life becomes so just ignore them it's their problem just make sure that you let them know it's their problem it's never your problem someone has asked that how do you keep yourself intact with the truth while studying such cases of uh, of course they're referring to uh, house of secrets studying such cases of beliefs and lies where its intensity is so high that it makes us question ourselves to an extent where we might start considering whether or not they were correct the you said the answer in your question that question yourself that itself and working with such content makes you question yourself so much that uh, just why did this happen because people didn't ask why so if it makes me question myself it's a great thing did you ever feel that okay did you i mean i guess what 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 the question is trying to hint at is that uh, the beliefs that the family uh, had while understanding wh- why happened wh- like why it happened the way it happened uh, were you ever feeling that okay some of it might make sense like you know why would why would someone like that in the family would believe something like this would buy into that stuff did you ever feel that okay ki ye cheez ye cheez ho sakti hai ye maybe ye shayad sach hoga no i had to believe that this will happen for 11 years obviously they were, they all had bought into it because obviously they were seeing something yeah but then where did it end so why would i stay with a belief that what they did was very powerful where did this end we also know that right okay so as asked uh, how do you see religious extremism and people with dumb minds and ideas getting confident day by day because they get mal- validation from majority of people you're not asking me a question you're telling something we heard you <laughs> okay ha uh, yeah uh, do you ever find yourself feeling uninspired of course we all have a good days and a bad days <laughs> every day i don't get up and say i have conquered the world <laughs> you know i have actually more things of what's the point of anything anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes uh, someone's asked uh, what was uh, what is the process uh, someone's asking you that how did your uh, experience in television shape your film making process i think we've uh, spoken about that i guess yeah i think uh, more than anything time management i learned a lot from tv um and i was trying to hold on to what i wanted to in films and not get corrupted <laughs> so yeah time management i think was my biggest takeaway and i got to experiment with some forms uh, do you think if if had shabd performed very well um like i mean um, what would corrupt you what would have corrupted you then or what would corrupt you today do you feel like there is something that would corrupt you see obviously if shabd had done very well at every point in life we are in sliding doors right so it would have been a different story in a lot of ways 
I just don't want to believe whether I'm idealistic or not, I don't know, but I don't want to believe that I would have in any condition in life made whatever just because it was available or it was accessible. For me, it's very important to question myself, like even today, why am I doing this? Why does this need to be told? And why is the audience need to sit for one hour, two hours, whatever to watch this? Why? Yeah. I hope that that wouldn't have changed in any scenario. Yeah. But uh, ma'am, don't you think earlier, like when we start start out, people keep telling us, "Keep jo kam mere, just just take it up, just shoot whatever you can." Because um, I spoke to Mohit sir, a person, a, a, a few months ago, and he told me, "Like, don't wait for that. Ki acha mere pehli picture to aisi honi chahiye. Main ye kahani leke banaunga. If you get an opportunity, grab onto it." Now, if we keep questioning that, don't you think that is something that will take a while for us to kind of do anything? No, I agree with Mohit. I did so much television content that that was not necessarily what, but I still made it mine. So if you see that potential in something, that is pe me apna chapa my individuality. This is does not become factory work. My individuality, I will be able to express if I do this. You should do it definitely because it is. It's not like the best man wins here. We know that is not the case at all. So one has to find a way in. It's not easy for anybody. Sure. Even the ones who are the insiders, it's not easy. Believe. Me. So Rachit has asked us that uh, as a writer, sometimes you are pretty confident about your idea, but someone else might just give you a bad feedback of the same. How do you tackle such a situation? Because you are pretty confident and you know that the person means well and they, they, they like they wouldn't give a wrong feedback. so how do you tackle such a situation when you are very confident about it okay so when you start off you know you hold on really tight to your idea and it just it's yours it's yours it's yours like i was just telling somebody yesterday that the writer part of me still has an emotional breakdown when i hand it to the director part of me, <laughs> the script you know and it's that much of possessiveness but listen at the end of the day you have to make it for people and this i've learned over time that you have you're making it for people and more than ever those choices have become so varied like i remember in the 90s me and my group of friends all loved a film or all hated a film today any film they will be from love to hate every end of the spectrum and very specific choices of why so at the end you're making it for people and you will find an audience within so try not to give it to one person give it to 10 or 15 people. or four people at least yeah here don't be reactive to anybody's feedback because if they are investing time and coming back to you what happens is before that person has even said ki mere ko ye theek nahi laga you become so defensive and no no how will it make sense this is the way it has to be <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh, listen as a filmmaker learn to listen a lot speak less listen more listen to everybody and you will see you may not agree with specifics but you will see within those four or 10 feedbacks they are some problem areas which will emerge then you find a solution to it they may not have the way to tell you the problem as well as the solution you may not agree with those but it will emerge for you i mean this is by a lot of practice it never goes wrong yeah you said that you you have almost Uh, you feel sad when the part of you hands it to it, but that is a um, is is it so divided like the those two aspects for you? Not really, but so for me, the most exciting part of the journey is being on set. Writing and editing are very lonely processes. <laughs> so you also <laughs> go through a personality disorder when you are writing because then it's just your world, right? but when the director steps yeah. in he's going to hand it out not just to the actor but to a technician every person there onwards is going to make a difference in the story that you're going to tell it is the most collaborative art do not fight it embrace it <laughs> you know <laughs> so it is yeah it is now it's going out you know it goes out there then it once it releases then it becomes a different zone again yeah so um, so finally the like, like the last uh, 
could not even a question it's almost like what would you say to aspiring filmmakers who are trying to make their first films or trying to write or not even write just who have a story who are trying to basically what would you tell me i'm trying to make my first film with no money and no stars uh, so like everyone it, this goes out for everyone what would what would you say to an aspiring filmmaker when it needs to be told and you know it has to be told it will come that's the only truth i there is no shortcut there is no algorithm that do this do this do this then you will get to do nothing you hear any filmmaker stories they are so different from each other and in the film world whether it's film school or film working you will only learn as much as you want to learn there are no exams to give you to the second one from the same film two assistant directors will come out knowing very different things sure so go for it <laughs> and i'm hoping like you uh, come across a world of people who want who support you in your uh, madness or passion whatever you want to call it yeah thank you so much ma'am thank you so much this is so enriching thank you so much for talking to us thank you thank you thank you